fiction. Science fiction. Horror. Fantasy. Crime. LGBT. Thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. One hundred two point three FM Riverside and one hundred five oh AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren, Mr. Michael Holly. It's Tuesday, so what's going on, Holly? Not much. How you doing? I'm I'm delicious, like they always say. <laughs> No, that's a, right. That's another right. Another day, busy month, of course. A lot of writers this month. A lot of uh, do the Patterson interview coming up, so that'll be yeah. interesting. Yeah, I'm excited. I, I'm going to be doing this Phelps interview. I'm excited. I've never heard of. No, it, actually, <laughs> this is uh, you know this is a I, this will be a great interview um, because he's he's done some, of course, lots of television and uh, written, I believe, 45 books. One thing I will say about the guest is that he. Uh, gets involved in the case he goes out there and he really does the research which i love those types of uh, oh, yeah. true crime writers rather than because there's a lot of stuff out there right now a lot of stuff and when you get writers like this it's easy to uh just go yeah pick up the book because you know it's going to be uh, done well so let's welcome him. so m william phelps thank you for being here thanks for having me call me matthew and uh hey i appreciate i appreciate that introduction well, you know, but it's true in a sense because I find that because um, I've done books myself and I've done TV shows, I've, I've done a lot of this stuff, and I really take it serious and I spend the time and I go out and meet the people and I do the, I do the book, I do the research, I, and and I think it's a good thing. I think you're doing something good for who you're writing it about. So so it's really important to do the book properly and spend the spend the time i think you know and um so i appreciate the work you do well i appreciate that uh, i mean i've dedicated my career to investigative journalism and i do get right into it i get on the ground i get you know i like to develop sources and talk to people and 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 get the real story besides the story as you said there's so much out there right now that you know a lot of it is just rehashed newspaper articles etc and um, so I like to get the story that's underneath the story. You know, I, I, I you know, I don't re you generally write about headline making stories, Murdoch, you know, a John Bonet, that sort of thing. I, I look for the stories that are within the fabric of America, um, you know, that are just not making headlines, but really tell the story of, of crime in America. What's, what's your kind of thoughts um, being in the crime world for so long? Um, do, do you think that um, crime is getting worse or better? You're touching on something here for me. <laughs> uh, I was just actually writing about this today, actually. I'm glad you asked, Alan. Uh, <laughs> um, this is not a setup. Um, uh, no, I, I, where is true crime? I don't like where true crime is headed. Um, I, I, I'm not a big fan of where it's at or where it's headed. And it, it, the reason I say that is there's just way too much of it. And the too much is, is not a good thing. Um, there's, there's too many podcasts. Um, I mean, I have two, but um, th there are way too many podcasts. Uh, there's all these self-published nonsense, uh, grammatically incorrect, unvetted, disgusting, terrible books that are just being put up on Amazon uh, and other online places, and I'm tired of it. Uh, I, I've had it up to here with it all. Uh, and, you know, and look, I have done uh, almost 400 hours of television in my career, and um, television is, is again, there's, there's just, they just keep regurgitating the same names over and over and over again. Um, Bundy, Dahmer, you know, Gacy... Um, and and there are just so many stories from the victim's point of view, from the families of the victim's uh, point of view that need to be told. 
Um, and what we're seeing and what we're reading about and what we're hearing is not what America is. Um, you know, I don't know what to do about it <laughs> um, other than add my contribution to it uh, the best I can, you know. You know, I have the same feeling. I get the same same thoughts in my mind. There's way too many of the podcasts out there that are just people – um, talking about what they've read on Wikipedia so much, yeah. you know, it's just, and, 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 you know, Hey, it's whatever people want to do, but I sort of, it turned me off the whole area. And, and again, I do books sort of like you, I've been going into places and I meet people and go to the prison and meet, and, and you talk to the family and they're really, I get them involved in the stories when I do true crime, because that's important. The story is about them and survivors and what goes on after the cameras are turned off and i again i agree with you i'm I'm not really into doing the ted bundy and you know the mainstream sort of stuff that you see 20 programs a year on if you want you know it's kind of it's it's overboard and i don't know i don't know why 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 are people so fascinated you think in this i get this question probably three times a week uh why why are is there so much uh, interest in true crime and and you know I read articles by psychologists and by people I call them the bow tie police you know professors etc uh, who who don't really know what they're talking about they're they're opening up uh, the DSM five and they're they're going through and they're looking well what well, well, where's true crime in this book what well, what's the disorder look uh, true crime has been Americans forever uh, you know whether it was Walter Cronk Kite talking about uh, the latest uh, big murder story, or you know, it was a Scooby Doo, uh, <laughs> y- you know, the cartoon when they were chasing, you know, uh, creepers. Uh, so we're all interested in a mystery and in solving a mystery or watching people solve a mystery. I like to say this I-, I like to say that, you know, when I was a kid, one of my favorite shows was Columbo. And Look, in Colombo, within two minutes, you know who the murderer is in that series. But you you stick around for the 90 minutes to see how Colombo is going to catch the guy or the gal. So, you know, we're, we're in search of with Leonard Nimoy. That was a big show. You know, we can date it back to... We can date it back to the 70s when that, that, that idiotic, now seemingly idiotic, um, Bigfoot, uh, um, uh, eight millimeter film came out of the Bigfoot in Patterson film. Yes. Patterson. Yes. Yes. That, that, that trumped up thing. And, and so, you know, it's like we want to solve this mystery. So it's only logical now with the amount of violence that is, you know, pumped out into the airwaves on TikTok and Twitter and, uh, on social media and on the internet that, you know, we up the ante, right? Um, in search of has become in search of a serial killer, right? So, um, you know, in search of Bigfoot has become in search of a serial killer. So it's, it's, it's just human nature, you know, and, um, look, if something is successful on television or in books, podcasting, whatever, you know, you're going to see a lot more of it. And, and there's no shortage of it on the streamers, you know, it's just the quality. You know, and when you get so much of it, the quality tends to lack. Um, the quality is just not there anymore. I mean, look at uh, uh, Thin Blue Line, you know, really the the pinnacle true crime documentary that w- was the first uh, true crime documentary that used recreations, um, Errol Morris, I believe. Um, and, you know, look how great that was. And, you know, and compare that to what you see today, you know. So... It's, yeah, uh, and, and like I said, all I can do is just keep doing what I'm doing the best I can do it uh, and try to keep raising the bar the best I can um, and be, I guess, content with knowing that I'm doing all I can to make this about the victim, the victim's families, about missing people, about minorities, about all of that. Um, I, I just do my part um, and hope, you know, that this curve, uh, you know, we, we get around this curve. So. I remember uh, in 2000, uh, a few years back, I was in uh, a series called Legend Hunter, and Pat Spain. What they were, he was a biologist, and what he was trying to do was basically debunk things. So, like, yes, he was he was talking about the, the White Chapel murders with me, but then he would go into, let's say, werewolves or any of that stuff. The reason why they canceled the show is because 
people didn't want to see that. Right. No, it makes sense. <laughs> so how it makes sense? So how do you? How would you? Uh, so let's say you're producing something and you have to go to let's say a, a network. You know, it's I can see it's how difficult it will be to sell it to the network. Oh, it's it's beyond difficult right now. I mean, it is beyond difficult right now to sell anything. Um, it, well, that is a, you know, the networks have so much control over the content when you get into um, true crime. Uh, they, they just, they take over the creative, basically. Um, and you either got to sign up for that and try to fight battles and, and get the wins you can, or you just have to walk away from it, you know. And you know, now when I get called, and I get called a lot to go on true crime shows, you know, I always take a look at the show and, and, and see what they're doing. Um, you know, I just filmed something for ABC uh, News Media, which is going to be good. I mean, I know it's going to be good. It's from the, you know, it's from the people who make 2020, and, you know, um, I, I know it's going to be a solid show, the best it can be for a network, you know. Um, and But you're, you're exactly right. I mean, it, 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 people want ghost hunters. They want, they want that. That ending where, whoa, oh my God, we don't know. We don't know. Elvis is back. Elvis yeah, is back. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, the networks are going to give the audience what they want, no matter what it is. And no matter what it is, they're going to give them what they want. And, you know, until that changes, we're just going to see, you know, what we see. Um, the great thing for me about podcasting, um, especially when we're talking about iHeartMedia, who, who does my my uh, a show, Paper Ghosts, which I'm just finishing up uh, the fourth season now, um, is that, you know, they kind of give me carte blanche. They kind of let me do my thing. You know, I, I never forget the meeting I went to uh, in New York with iHeart, and they were just starting the podcast division, to, uh, and they, you know, um, I met with um, uh, the, the, the two heads there of, of, of the podcast division, and they said, listen, we know how to distribute. We know how to sell advertising. We know how you're the true crime guy. You do your thing. Let us do our thing. And I love that type of relationship, um, a partner like that. Because, yeah, I mean, it, it's not all, you know, it's, it's not always a linear narrative. It's not always a, a, a bow tie at the end. It's not always, you know, going to wrap up like you hope it will. And that's part of it. That's part of what I do. That's the investigative journalism part of what I do is I, I, I get the story and I, and I allow victims' families to speak and I talk about the victims. And then I, I look for information in unsolved cases and missing person cases that simply wasn't there before. And I've, and I've done a pretty good job of digging up new information with just about all of the stuff that I've done, uh, especially podcasting. Um, and so, but TV will never, would never allow that. TV would never, ever. They, they want to know what the bow tie looks like, what color it is, everything, uh, before you start filming. I mean, they, they, they want to know all of that. There's, there's, there's no surprise endings in TV um, before you start filming. Um, and, and, and you either got to sign up for that or you don't. You know, and right, right now I, I am signed up for it. Um, you know? Um, so, um, you know, and, and look, I'm not – complaining although i might sound like it i'm not bitter uh, i'm just i don't like where it's headed you know i i want to see it I, I i mean because there is a lot of good stuff out there and it gets lost in all the muck of you know everything else you know right there's got to be it, it used to be it seemed to be more um it, it, there there was a, a pretty decent level of quality that was around and now it's kind of a just a, it's a free for all so there's just everything going on, and that's TV and radio and everything. It's just kind of. I mean, you, you're so you're so right. I mean, and, and for example, I have a story that came to me this year that I'm debating whether to go to TV with it or or or, or, or what, just because um, of certain things. But you know, I, I'll just give you the, the. I mean, the first two minutes of of the documentary, and it's a winner. The uh, you know I have a PO box for my uh, business for my brand in another town for obvious reasons, right? Yeah. And that's yeah. that's where all the mail comes in from killers and serial killers and fans and, and that sort of thing. So I go there every couple of weeks to check 
pick up everything. So I go there this summer, and, um, you know, it's, it's a P.O. box. It's, you know, three by three or whatever. It's very small. And I get there, and Fred, the, the postal clerk, says, hey, Phelps, you, you know, all that stuff there in the back, that's all yours. And I said, what stuff? He goes, all, all those boxes. And there was like 15 legal-sized boxes and a package on top. And I said, that can't be for me. And he said, yeah, it's addressed to you. And he said, but it's also the return address is you. Ah. Did you send it to yourself? I said, Fred, why, why the hell would I send myself 15 boxes? Come on. So I go over to it. I look at it all. I pick up the package off the top, and it's a, it's a manila envelope. And I open up this package, and there's a letter in it. And here, I'll stop here. Here's the first line of the letter. When you receive all of this, by the time it gets to you, I would have already killed myself. Oh, boy. That's the first line. So in a, if I'm doing a documentary, that's, you know, you go to commercial right there. That's huge. Everyone's coming back for that, you know. Now, as the story carries on, it's not going to become, uh, at certain parts, it's not going to become the story that, uh, say, true crime TV would, would, would sign off on all of it. So I'm debating, you know, maybe I hold on to this for uh, a little bit and, and, and keep investigating it and, you know, um, but yeah, so now I question everything is, I, I think my point is, and that now I question, you know, what am I going to do with this? You know, am I, is this going to be a podcast? Uh, am I going to write a deck and, and, and produce a sizzle for it and pitch it to TV? That's very rare that that happens now for me over the past couple of years, um, just because of the market right now um, and, w and what they're looking for and where it's at. I mean, it's just, it's not my game, you know? Well, you could, you have more control and you have a better product if you kind of, kind of run it yourself rather than going to sometimes to some of these places, I, I would guess for the most part. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, for, you know, I do a lot of work with different production companies all over L.A., all, all over New York, and, you know, they're, they're always coming to me for ideas and, you know, what do you have now and stuff like that. And, you know, we both look at each other a lot and say, oh, this is going to be tough, you know, um, today, you know. And, and so it's – see, and this is what I'm talking about when I say that the abundance of the stuff hurts the stuff. Because then you got a guy like me who's got a real great story that people will, will just jump aboard and follow to the end. And I know that it's not going to go much further than development. And so I hold off. And, and what does that do? That it's not out there, right? It, it doesn't get out there. So that's why I say the cookie cutter stuff just keeps on, you know. I mean, makeup and murder? Makeup and murder is like one of the top, like, 60, 70 podcasts in the con in, out of all podcasts, makeup and murder. So, y you know, and these, these makeup and murder videos on, on TikTok that, you know, someone's just reading, as you said, uh, Wikipedia uh, off a case and they're putting on makeup. These things get millions of views. So I, I can't explain that. I, I can't explain that. So it's, you know, and I try to, I, I've interviewed some of these people and, you know, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's bothersome to me, you know, because in it all, ultimately the victim and the victim's families get lost. And that's the stuff that just enrages me. They get lost in all of it, you know. Well, you could always try doing some makeup while you do your. <laughs> I've, I have, but I've been on. I've been. A, I've been. I, I. I did a funny actually TikTok one day. I was. I was. I was getting ready to shoot something, um, for um, TV, and I was in the restroom, and I was putting on some powder before the interview, and I did a little TikTok that said, "Yep, I'm actually putting on makeup, and then I'm going to go do true crime on TV." I, I, I'm not mixing the two together. I'm not going to give you the story <laughs> now. <laughs> you know? So, uh, um, yeah. Uh, and look, there's a younger generation now that's turning to true crime. And we see that with Crime Junkie, the number two podcast out of all podcasts. Um, and, you know, Ashley Flower, she's, you know, uh, look, she's very successful. She does a good job. Uh, she's, she's managed to really just rope in that young, young audience. They love her. You know, and, and how, why, how, I don't, I don't know. Um, it, it just is what it is, as they say, you know. 
Yeah, I think I think the only thing is that I think it's um, there's not a lot of substance to it. It's just flash, and it's just the moment, and there's something new every day, and th- there's no depth. Nobody's really getting into anything. There's no there there's nothing but pure entertainment. And and a lot of times when I've seen some of the TikToks, even on stories I've covered, they even get it wrong. Yeah, they they always get it wrong. I mean, yeah. look, look. You know, another thing is Crime Con and this. Uh, this year at Crime Con, um, one of the Idaho, that Idaho, the four murders of right, the college right. kids. One of the mothers showed up, and she sat and she listened to a talk in the back of the room that a forensic guy was giving about the Idaho case. And then she got up on the mic and said, "Well, you pronounced my son's name wrong, number one, and you got some facts wrong." You know, so, you know, uh, the, some of these people are being called out, but, you know, does it change anything? I don't know. But, yeah, they get stuff wrong all the time. I, and it, and, it, and once it's out there, it's out there. I mean, it, there's nothing you can do. It's just, it's you know, millions of people have seen it. Look, we all get stuff wrong. I mean, I've written 46 books. I, there's, there's mistakes in those books, not intended. But, you know, stuff happens. Um, you know, I try to vet everything with lawyers, everybody, uh, editors, producers, everything, you know, to the max. But, you know, you're going to miss stuff. But, you know, this this stuff that's out there now is just blatantly, you know, just regurgitated newspaper articles and Wikipedia and Internet, you know, news that's not even news. You know, it's blogs and what have you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the... Uh uh, here it is. Uh, I, you know, you you re- wrote that you're an investigative journalist. To me, that was your game a long time ago. That's like your core uh, discovery. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, I, when I got into uh, writing books in the 90s, um, yeah, I, I just dove right in and started, you know, investigating the case. Uh, just because the case was adjudicated or not didn't mean there wasn't more story to tell. So I just started sniffing around. You know, and and I wanted the bigger story. I wanted exclusive information. I wanted the story that wasn't being told. You know. So now, with uh, where you are at, where you're, it seems to me that you're so overwhelmed with all of this stuff. Do you miss some of the stuff that you could have done, could have gotten in deeper with, or do you have the time to do that? Uh, uh, no, I do it now with you know with Paper Ghosts, my podcast. I, I mean, I just I, I spent. I spent a lot of time this summer out in the Ozarks, and that's where the the two cases I'm covering in season four, that's that's where they originate. So I, I spent you know a tremendous amount of time out there developing sources, knocking on doors, approaching suspects, that sort of thing. So yeah, that's I'm, a little dangerous, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a, it depends. It depends. Uh, it really not. Okay. I mean, I guess it could. I guess it could be, but um, you know, you know. I, I, I've done so many books about serial killers. I've interviewed so many serial killers. These guys, they're afraid of guys like me. They don't. They, they go after women and children. They don't go after guys like me. They go after people who they can control. They can't control me, you know. So um, they're, they're very much cowardly when it comes to that. But uh, nonetheless, I mean, I guess it could be dangerous. Um, but I always make sure I cover myself. <laughs> um uh, when I do this stuff, I, I have certain things I do, you know, um, uh, things I have, uh, things. Yeah, but I, no, I'm deeper in it now than I ever was, actually, the I investigative guess. part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because Paper Ghosts and iHeartRadio or iHeartMedia has allowed me to do that. They've said, you go do your thing. And my thing is to get in, you know, neck deep in the stuff, you know. So uh, I said, okay, I will. You know, well, you know, I always just give them Mike's address when I'm out there. <laughs> yes, hey, yeah, this is where I live. Here's my phone well, number. I will too. Now. Yeah. now, Al does that because the serial killers he's interviewed are behind bars. Yeah, so they can't touch them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, they, so when you when you're doing paper ghosts like this is like you just said finishing fourth. What what do you do in your podcast? What are people going to get when they listen to one of your series? So paper ghosts. Is a uh, is an investigative narrative uh, uh, podcast chapters, if you will. So it's usually eight to ten episodes, and it, it's a it, you know I follow the case from beginning to end, and uh, each week it comes out when it 
when it's, the first episode is released, it, you know, it rides every week until the eight or ten episodes are up. And you get a new episode every week, but it, it furthers the story along. So it's like a limited series you'd see on Netflix, if you will, um, in podcast form. And, you know, it's me, boots on the ground, investigating the case, interviewing, you know, for this one, I think I've done a 100 interviews. Um, it, it's it's it, it's getting into the documents. I, I try to score, obviously, audio for the podcast uh, that no one's heard. And, you know, and I come back and I go through it all and I build a board and I try to figure it all out and I continue to investigate. And, uh, you know, I, I, I write up the episodes. I have like three, four people working for me that, you know, an audio guy, a, 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 a producer, a script consultant, a sound design, a executive producer. And, you know, I, I, you know, I put it all together and then we go through it and vet it and, and yeah. And so it's a, it's a limited series. It's a narrative uh, from A to Z of, of not necessarily a case. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, there, it's a case that develops, you know, like, for example, the one I'm doing now is the case out of uh, the lower southern Ozarks where a, a young woman left the store one day and went missing. Two months later, a body's found. Uh, a year later, another body's found. And so uh, this stuff starts developing. And, you know, uh, I interview who, whoever I can. I take you through the whole case. Do you have a makeup artist, too? <laughs> I don't for that because, you know, <laughs> you can see me about as well as you can right now. <laughs> well, you just you never know. You might want to do some videos to promote it. I just say that. <laughs> when you get to these serial killers, one of the biggest things I hear is well around the world and on, on these shows and all that, they're always trying to give you the reason why this person killed right. or did what they did. And it drives me nuts because most of the time the people they talk, they're they talking about, they've never interviewed, they don't have any psychological reporting on them. We don't know anything about them other than, well, their mother was cruel to them when they were five or oh, their father yeah. was a drunk. And I'm thinking, you know, should I had that. I, I, You know, there has to be more, but everyone's looking for that quick fix answer, and I think it's much deeper. Well, no one really says or wants to say what the truth is for serial killers. They enjoy it. They enjoy killing. That's their game. They like to kill. They get a high off it. They're driven by f fantasies. They relive those fantasies through uh, torturing and raping and killing victims. And But that's not the sexy answer that people want to hear. I mean, that's, but that's the, you know, when you're dealing with a psychopath, you have to throw everything that you know as a person who's not a psychopath out the window because they don't think like you or I or, or you know. So uh, in very few um, things that I've seen uh, delve into this, uh, a really great documentary, it's an hour long, it's, it's, there's no flash to it, um, it's called Psychopath. I think it's available on, you know, you can get it on YouTube, whatever, uh, on two ninety nine, whatever. It's an hour long. It's like an edu almost an educational film, but uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Hare is in it. And Dr. Robert Hare developed the 20 characteristics, uh, the checklist right, right. Uh, of a psychopath. So he's in it. And they go into prisons and they interview psychopaths. And you will get exactly what a psychopath is when you're done with watching this uh, the 60 minutes. You, it will be clear to you who they are. Um, and if you've, if, if you've ever sat in front of a serial killer and looked them in the eye, you, you see that. You see the shallow gaze. You see the emptiness there. You see that they don't care. They, they just don't care. Uh, be that the fault of the way they were born without you know, uh, empathy, uh, sympathy, love, whatever, or uh, the abuse they suffered or whatever. I mean, uh, the hundreds of thousands of kids are abused and uh, they don't turn out to be serial killers. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, the real answers aren't as sexy as the ones that, you know, um, people want to hear. Uh, and, uh, and I try to give it straight up. This is who they are. This is what they do. And this is why they do it, you know. Um, there isn't an answer always. It's the answer is they like it. It's fun. It, it, I interviewed one serial killer for twelve years. Twelve years worth of interviews, hundreds and hundreds of hours of audio and 
Skype and visiting him. And he wrote me 9,000 pages of letters. And, and, and so, you know, I dug deep into that mind uh, to get at the core of what drove him. And there's nothing driving him. It's just what he does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, his, his comment uh, one time to me was, you know, um, you know, 90% of the time I was a good guy. 10% of the time I wasn't. And, you know, I, I asked all the questions everybody would want to ask, you know, are, are you evil? And he said, well, I don't believe in evil, but if there is a thing called evil, I am it for sure. So it, it's really textbook, you know. The other thing that I think uh, 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 has been perpetrated over the years on television and especially with serial killer shows is that that they're the, the typical live in the basement, drive a van, um, you know, they, they were abused and, you know, like you said, you know, alcoholism and beaten and, and all this. And, and some of that may be true, but the reality of, of it all is they're atypical. One serial killer is not like the next serial killer right. in, that, in that sense, you know, in, in the psychological sense of they, they enjoy killing, yes, but... You know, uh, they're not all cut from the same fabric, uh, the same cloth. They're not. Right. It's probably like uh, when you look at the, the Long Island serial killer, although there's not a prosecution yet, but even the, the people that worked under him were completely astounded. That, uh, but probably one of the reasons is because we have this cookie-cutter idea of what serial killers are. They don't fit that. <laughs> right. I mean, if 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 that kind of rhetoric wasn't out there they would have probably noticed more about him because he did give off some indication that not that he was a serial killer no one can give that off but um but that he wasn't right yeah you know um and and yeah you just you stay away from those people you know we know in life we know well, that person there that person's not right you know you stay away from that person. Like, and sometimes <laughs> dogs know that, and people don't listen to their dogs. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's very true. Yeah, it's very true. Dogs have you heard mine bark earlier. Yeah, well, that's that's because of Mike, not me. Uh, you know, I just started talking a little bit, and then your dog picked that up. What <laughs> the heck? <laughs> yeah, where is he? Where is he? You've got you've got the relaunch of a book, uh, Dead Soul. Um, so what's that about? Yeah, what's that? What's going on there? The Dead Soul is um, uh, about ten years ago. I decided I wanted to write a thriller. Um, I, I, I wanted to take what I learned about serial killers and all the cases that I had not done anything with, and I wanted to create some characters around that and, and, and just write a bona fide beach, uh, sit by the fire, sit in bed thriller. And that's what the dead soul is. It's, it's fiction and it's, um, it's about, a. a um, a, a, a detective with a great name, I should say. I, I'm very proud of myself. Jake Sundance Cooper, who is a detective in the Boston Police Department. And he, um, you know, he's a bit em embattled. He's, his, his career is imploding. He needs a big solve, if you will. Um, and there's some corruption going on in the Boston PD that he, he's starting to sniff around at. Meanwhile, there's a serial killer leaving bodies along the freedom trail and and so there's some there's some there's a little bit of hollywood in it you know i wrote the book as kind of a screenplay if you will so you could just burn through it but uh, you know the psychological aspects of it i i, I try to i try to keep legit um w w with the hollywood stuff being you know uh the surroundings etc but yeah so it's a it's a who done it yeah so who done it who is he what did he do and who's going to die next you know and will jake sundance cooper uh, will he save his career and solve the case to live for another book? And and yeah, so it's it. And Wild Blue Press uh, uh, decided to uh, reissue it um, this week. Um, so I made some updates, and yeah, it's a fun little book, fun little sadistic book. <laughs> Good words together. Um, so when you get into a thriller like this, how do you get into the characters that you write? Like, how do you? How do you experience them? Are you hearing dialogue? Do you kind of... Um... Did you hear me sigh? Yeah. Did you hear <laughs> well, me? I mean, I mean, yeah. So, well, I, I'm in, always interested in that and in, in kind of what you're experiencing when you're writing something like that. Here's why I don't write a lot of these. Because with the nonfiction, I can compartmentalize. I can come into my office at 5.30 a.m., which I usually do, leave at 5, 
shut the door and, you know, and I can go watch a cooking show. And every the world is good. Phelps' world is good. With the fiction, you know, once I turn it on, it it's, doesn't seem to shut off for me. So I find myself in bed writing notes. I find myself driving, taking notes. You know, I'm at the beach. Take, I'm at dinner. You know, it's just it. I, I've turned this story on, and it doesn't stop until I'm done with it. And so that's my process. I just go with it. You know, I just I go with that. Um, but how do I create them? You, you know, look, when you're creating fiction, you're stealing from everybody that you know, everybody you see in the supermarket. Uh, uh, um, you know, you are, you are thieving from those people's lives. Um, and anybody who tells me different is a liar. Um, James Patterson included, uh, everybody is a liar. Well, I'll tell them. Um, so, so, yeah, you tell them I said that. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, there's no way you can make all of that up. You know, when if I see something, if I read something about, look, if I read something about Stalin or or Trump or Biden or whoever, and I like it, and I and I think, ooh, I can add that one little twerk to my guy. What that one little thing will just add another layer of character to my guy or my killer or whatever. So. I'm constantly reading. Uh, when I'm writing a, a fiction, I'm, I'm reading a lot more than I am actually writing. Um, all, all kinds of stuff. I'm just reading everything I can, um, uh, and and nonfiction wise, and and yeah, it just develops for me. It just it just develops for me out out of that. What, what takes the most out of you? Like when you when you're writing a a story about true events, and you're going around and you're talking about the family and the survivors and then the, the victims and the killers themselves and stuff. So you write a true story, that's one thing. When you write a fiction, it's another. But which do you think takes the most out of you emotionally or changes you, for instance? Um, well, I, I, it's fatigue-wise. Just as far as endurance, it would be fiction because it's nonstop for me. Right. Um, emotionally, it's it's like I, I had this series on Discovery Channel uh, uh, years, 10, 12 years ago, Dark Minds, where I, I went around the country and uh, I looked at unsolved serial killer cases. And that was just the heaviest thing I've ever done. I mean, I sat in living room after living room of mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, boyfriends who had lost kids, people to serial killers. And some days I would interview two or three families, a 12 hour day. And, and just, it, it just takes, you know, you, you just take on, I'm an empath by nature. So you just, I just take on all that pain. You know, it, it just, it, it was a lot. Uh, we would, I would go on the road three, four months at a time. And you you know, on the road, when you're filming a show, you know, you're six days on one day off and they're, you know, they're twelve hour days, sometimes more. Just especially with mothers and fathers who lost kids. Uh the some of the cases I did involved, you know, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, sixteen year old kids, even younger. That was the worst. I I mean, I, that was the worst. What do you say? What what do you say? I'm in your living room with lights, with a camera, with, you know, a bunch of people. You know, we got garbage bags on your windows to block out the light. And, you know, you're talking about the worst moment of your life, you know. And and that's, and I'm sitting in front of, you know, these people and I'm just, yeah. And it, you know, and, and yeah, it made, it made for great TV, but it was, it was, I mean, yeah, it was, it was all consuming. And yeah, that was, who? That was four years you did that? I did that for three seasons. Yeah, I did three seasons. 22 episodes, three seasons for invest. Yeah, it was, first it was Discovery Channel, and then it became, of course, Investigation Discovery, but we did three seasons of that. It's just, you know, I ran out of cases. I mean, there's only so many unsolved cases, and, and to be honest, I mean, it was, I was looking to do something different at that point. Um, I was still writing books at the same time. Um, I never missed a beat writing books while I did that show and, and did the show and, you know, and, and, and I, I brought out a lot of information again during that show. They let me do some stuff, not everything I wanted, but you know, they let me do some stuff. I'll give investigation discovery that much. They, they did let me do some stuff. Um, I mean, the, the hook of the show was, you know, they, they could not deny the hook of the show. The hook of the show was, you know, I went out and I looked at, for example, I, I looked at Long Island serial killer case ten years ago when nobody even heard of it, 
I, lo I looked at that. I looked at the Atlantic City. I looked at the uh, Highway of Tears in British Columbia. I mean, Israel Keys, all, all these different cases all over the country. And guiding me along the way was I had a real serial killer on the phone who I would send him information about the cases and get his kind of me being Clarice, he being, you know, Han Hannibal Lecter. Um, right. I would get his take on the case. And so, you know, and he would be, he was on the show. He, I never named him while the show was running. Uh, he had a quote unquote code name on the show, which I didn't come up with. Um, uh, the, 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 the president of the network did. Um, and, and so he would come on the phone and, and we'd discuss the case, uh, together. And he'd say, ah, oh, you know, you're looking for, we disguise his voice, you know, you know, this is the guy you're looking for. He's this type of guy. And, you know, so that was the hook. And, it, you know, it, it worked. I mean, it, it was it was good. You're looking for a radio host. <laughs> when you're looking back on it, when, now that they found uh, the Long Island Serial Killer, Sir, Sir Killer, was he close? And his real keys. Was he close? I don't know if he was close. Um, I, I think we were close. Me and my, I had a forensic psychologist who I consulted with on the show, John Kelly, a great guy, taught me a lot of what I know today. Y you know, we... With Long Island serial killer, we we had a feeling it was somebody very very local, um, very local, uh, and we kept I kept hearing that. Also, you know, I want to say about that case, um, you have two separate cases there, and I and I and I said this on the show. I believe there's two separate cases here. You have the four on the highway and Shannon Gilbert. That's one serial killer case, and then over in the Marsh area, which is far away. I mean, it's not like right around the corner. You have all these other bodies that have been dismembered, et cetera. There's a male even over there. There was a pregnant woman. There's, you know, their, their, their limbs are found 40 miles away in the Pine Barrens. A head is found on Fire Island, you know, that sort of thing. So you have two separate serial killer cases, I think, going on there. And, and I pretty much know who's responsible for the other ones. That, that is a given. Uh, and and uh, this has been reported to the right people, and they just, you know, they... Just, they don't want to hear from a guy like me. Um, but I, I developed some really great sources for that, that, um, anonymous sources who, who know, knew those victims very well. Um, and they told me what's going on there. And it makes all, all the sense in the world. You know, when we think about serial killers, we, we have to stop thinking about, you know, as we talked about earlier, the guy who lives alone or he's married and he lives in a dingy house and you know he hides oh my in the base we have to stop and and consider everything because don't forget you know gangs in the country pick their psychopath to be their serial killer so that guy goes out and he you know kills you know this this rival this rival that's a serial killer whether we want to you know we'd never do a documentary about that on netflix because it's not sexy Right? It's, it's, but it's still serial killing. You know, so, uh, organized crime, you know, mob, mob guys, hitmen, you know, they're serial killers. The Iceman. I mean, these people are serial killers. So, uh, when, when we, when you look at these cases, unsolved cases, you have to consider all of that. You can't just, can't just say, oh, geez, I'm looking for that guy who drives the beat up truck. He, you know, he, he works construction and he drinks at the bar every night. And then once a month he goes out. And he finds someone, you know, and, you know, when we find him, you know, he's going to have 10 bodies in the basement and, you know, his dad sexually abused, the, you know, all of that. That's we, we have to forget to look at these things. We can't look at them just that way. We have to look at you can't get blinders on. You have to look at it every which way. Right. Hey, Al, are we able to interview Matthew for another two hours? No. <laughs> no. Thanks, man. Okay, I had a lot of questions. Yeah, thanks, man. No, no, we are. Kind of cover the end. I was going to say, so, you know, how do you like to be found uh, by by people like uh, social media, website? What's what's your favorites? Uh, I mean, you can go to mwilliamphelps.com, and then from there you can get into everything else, uh, you know, the podcasts, um, my social media. You can, at, at mwilliamphelps, you can find me on all the social media stuff. Um, and uh, YouTube, I, I have some stuff up. So, yeah. Well, great. Well, of course, we'll have that up on the website, and I found you on TikTok, so I followed you, just so you know. Oh, good. <laughs> nice. you know, I've got I, a, I hate I it, could, but I, I, have, I, I, I have to do it, but I hate it. 
Yeah, I'm not really a fan of it, but I've got I've got a pretty good following, so I, I I'm kind of stuck with it at the moment. Yeah, so. yeah, that's that's good. But that's I'm good. not wearing any makeup. So yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I'll leave that for Mike. Put some makeup on someday and talk about a murder, and you'll probably get more following. It will be even See? even hotter. I just uh, I've got <laughs> enough. I've got enough of that stuff going on. So. Or put on a dress. Um. <laughs> Again, I leave that for Michael. I'm not a... <laughs> well, that's skirting the issue, though. Oh, oh see. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. See? Yeah, that's why he's there. Well, we, we appreciate you and uh, work you're doing, and I think it's fantastic. And, again, uh, thank you. So, M. William Phelps. Matt, thank you. Hey, thanks for having me. Nice speaking with you, Matthew. You too, Mike. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.com. HouseofMystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This is here the production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.